If you watch NFL films and you remember the post San Francisco San Diego Super Bowl where Steve Young's tossing the monkey off his back, it's kind of how it was for Miami last night against West Virginia, winning a bowl game for the first time in 10 years. We bring in Cam Underwood from State of the U, flexing his muscles and uh, smiling ear to ear. Cam, how are you? I'm good. I'm awesome. <laughs> Y'all, let's do that. Let's get that monkey off the back. All those kind of things. I feel really good. I uh, was up at the game in Orlando yesterday, drove up yesterday, hung out with a bunch of my friends, uh, had some really nice seats on the 25 yard line and like the ended up being like the third row kind of uh, second row thing uh, there behind like the the handicapped access seats were the second row behind that. So third row, however you want to look at it. But right down front, um, it was awesome. There were a lot of Canes fans uh, that were up there. Obviously, you know, having a game in the state of Florida was great. And, uh, you know, it was a lot better than the last time that I had made that drive up to Orlando to go watch a bowl game in that stadium. And like you said, it's the best bowl game result that we've had since 2005 with the Micron PC Bowl, I believe that was, um, against Nevada. Um, yeah, so it's it's been a while. I uh, had to dig deep for that, but uh, yeah, it's all uh, it's all smiles and uh, and jocularity over here today because thirty one to fourteen. So West Virginia got uh, got dealt with. So it feels good. Cam, this was a game that was tabbed by many people, including myself, as a must see early bowl game. This is going to be one of the better matchups of the early bowl season before we get to the playoffs, etc. And a lot of us were scratching our head trying to figure out who's going to win this game. Oh, it's going to be razor close. We can see where West Virginia's top 15 in the country. They've got 10 wins, but Miami's got the better roster. And wow, after a few series of this game, uh, this defensive stand that Miami took on West Virginia, a team that ranked 12th in the nation in total offense, 500 plus yards per game, threw it all over the field, had the three-headed rushing attack, a thousand yard rusher, and just clamped down. Yeah, man. I mean, that's Manny Diaz, our defensive coordinator. Um, he, sh I still say he should have been a finalist for the Broyles Award for the best assistant coach in football or in college football. Uh, between him and Craig Kuligowski, the defensive line coach, our front seven gets up the field. We wreak havoc. Uh, we do business in people's backfields. Uh, coach Kuligowski, his Twitter at is Let's Meet at the QB, which is awesome for a defensive line coach. And we had what? nine tackles for loss for 54 total yards for loss yesterday um dropped a, what would have been a pick six um you know and we just we clamped them down like i that's the thing like even when we did the preview video and when i we did the staff predictions on state of the U, it for me it just came down to the fact that west virginia couldn't play with us like like you said they don't have our kind of roster they don't kind of have our kind of speed they couldn't run with us they couldn't play with us they couldn't stick us on defense on their defensive side like, there was just really nothing about that game that led me to believe, even leading up to this, and you can go back and look at the video and read the website, leading up to this game, this is how I felt, you know, and uh, we were doing the math, uh, Mark and I, before we got on the, the screen, what was it? It was the last six drives of the first half, they had 13 total yards. That was West it. West Virginia. I mean, look, that's elite, you know, and if you go down the last five drives, they had negative yardage. You know, so, I mean, we did what we needed to do. We made those adjustments. And the touchdown drive that they got, both of them were buoyed by personal foul penalties against Miami. So the one with the kick catch interference, which was a terrible call because the guy didn't call for a fair catch and Travis Homer didn't touch him, wasn't within two yards, and the ball hit him off his head and then bounced away. You get a 15-yard penalty on that, and that ends up being a 39-yard touchdown drive. The other touchdown drive in the third quarter, um, Michael Pinckney got ejected for targeting, and I'm one of the few who thinks that that was a proper call. I'm not going to call it a good call, I hate it, but with the receiver was kind of almost going to the ground, Pinckney had to lead with his head to get down there. So I think that was a proper call. I hate that rule. I hate it for the kid who was one of our best linebackers was playing amazingly in that game. But you get an extra 15 yards on that drive, and then they score again. So West Virginia fans were talking to me today and yesterday talking about, oh, well, Miami got all these calls and that one pass interference on the ball that Brad threw down the seam to Stacey Coley when the guy was you know, dragging him or had his jersey for 20 yards or whatever. Looking at that, I'm like, look, the only reason that they got points 
came on drives where we gave up personal foul penalties. So, yeah, across that, you know, Skylar Howard is garbage. Their quarterback, West Virginia's, um, and that's what he looked like. Um, you know, the rushing attack, they got us with the – it looked like inverted veer, but when uh, Justin Batavio, our X's and O guy today, it's, it was actually a power read option uh, kind of thing where they pulled the backside guard to the front side, and they're doing that kind of read option, inverted veer kind of thing. They scored on us on that, but, I mean, outside of that, they didn't do anything rushing. Um, Shelton Gibson, one of their wide receivers who was supposed to be good, he was talking all this noise about how they were going to be so great and not corn elder out of the draft contention because they were going to just hit him up the top uh, with passes and everything all day long. I don't know what Shelton Gibson did in the game, but I went on Twitter after the game and, oh boy, West Virginia fans were mad at him because – he woke up the monster. Like, he poked the bear. Corn had a great game. You had Adrian Colbert came back, only played in, like, what, it was his sixth game because he had hurt a wrist. But he came in, had that play where, again, just like at Notre Dame, they tried to go the little now screen with the receiver in front of him. He beats that block, flips the guy over. That might have even been the Shelton Gibson kid. Uh, or Gibson was the one who missed the block. One of the two. Anyway, Colbert goes in there, flips the kid over in the fourth quarter, and then comes out of the ball game saying, well, basically, look, I did that. I hit him so hard. That's going to be the last play of my college career because you can't get better than that without a pick six. So, I mean, yeah, I know it, it. this shifted from, like, numbers to, to emotions, but Miami's defense did what we do, gave up a little bit, made adjustments, and without us hurting ourselves on defense, West Virginia would have been shut out. So I think that's a credit to all of the guys that we have on defense. Joseph Jackson, my man, that freshman cyborg, like I'm telling you about, he had a sack and a half or two sacks in that game. Chad Thomas in the backfield all day long. And if you didn't see this, on the day before the game, they had like a little gathering between the two teams. And Chad is a music engineering major, plays piano. So he got up there and played a little piano while he was rapping over it. So what was his celebration every time he made a play? Playing them keys. So, I mean, he was doing that. Cortell Jenkins had a great game. Mike Pickney had a great game till he got ejected. Shaq Quarterman had a great game. Jamal Carter and Rayshon Jenkins. Like, I'm just going down the list on defense. They, these kids all out all day long. And it was, just, it was great to see. It was wonderful. You know, in West Virginia, honestly, they had no answers. And if you look across the board, this is not the same team um, that won that Orange Bowl against Clemson. And, like, Mark and I were talking about this before we came on air where Tavon Austin just scored again against Clemson because that was ridiculous. This team doesn't have that kind of skill. They don't have that kind of talent. Um, I read a couple pieces talking about the development of a Dana Holgerson offense. You had to develop the offense. Why? Because you don't got those horses. But you know who has those horses? The Canes defense. And that's what showed up yesterday. Sure did. It looks like a 1970s box score, especially for a team that plays in the Big 12 that's used to running around the field. And, and, and I think sometimes a – the way the Big 12 has played football in recent years, it's almost like a different game. And these teams sometimes get a little shocked when they get into a situation where they're actually going to get hit in the mouth and they're actually going to have a guy breathing down their back and breathing down their neck, running down the field. And they're not going to just be running, waving their hands in wide open space, catching passes. Uh, it's just a different style of football uh, that a team like Miami brings to the table. So on the offensive side, Brad Kaya, much like, we saw uh, across the board offensively uh, a bit of a rough start. Nothing tragic, disastrous, but a bit of a slow start. And then he throws four touchdown passes and hits on 24 of 34. Yeah, Ty, uh, um, the offense started slow. And I'm not just going to put it on him. Um, but it was, it was very conservative from the start. Um, you know, I know that Miami wanted to run the ball. Obviously, that's the DNA of a Mark Rick offense. But it was very conservative. You know, inside run, inside run, five-yard pass. Or, no, they tried to throw, like, a 12-yard pass on third and seven, but uh, he sailed it out of bounds, which was the best play because if you throw it late on there, you know, it's going to be intercepted on the far sideline. Um, but we went – what was it? We went, like, um, almost 20 minutes of act, game action without getting a first down. Um, and that was frustrating to me in the stands because, like I said, I, I didn't never thought that West Virginia could stick us. On, and this is that's me in a basketball kind of term. They just couldn't stick us. They couldn't play man to man. They couldn't do it. You looked at the corners, and you know their heels are at twelve yards off the receiver all day. And my buddies and I in the stands were saying, "Look, throw the now route, the stop route, the 
zero, whatever you want to call it, throw it out there and take those yards. And when they finally made that adjustment, they went RPO, boom, quick out to Amon Richards. What happened? Touchdown. And then, okay, we're going to do that again. Then in the two-minute drill, we're going to go. It was a beautiful combination. You had the inside receiver run a curl, and you had the outside receiver run a, a dig route at about 12 yards behind it. And we did that down the field, left, right, left, right, and just kept doing it. And then that touchdown to Barrios, instead of the inside guy running that hook, Boom. We were a three verticals seam. So you got outside and then you got a seam route. So the guy's thinking, okay, he's going to squat on this curl and Barrios is by him. Boom. You get that little side adjustment up top. Touchdown is 21 to seven before you even know what happens. You know, um, but it, it when when he got time, when Brad got time and the offense adjusted a little bit, we were just rolling. I mean, and you just saw it across the board. Malcolm Lewis had a touchdown, fifth year senior. Um, who five years ago had that nasty, nasty ankle injury against Georgia Tech. I mean, his final game. Um, Richards had the first touchdown. Um, Barrios had the touchdown of the seam. David Njoku had another touchdown. Um, and we're going to talk about him a little bit uh, later. But, you know, it was just like the Duke game where you hit him on a little, you know, kind of out route. And it's one-on-one with the defender. And it's a cornerback. He's not big enough to get David Njoku on the ground. So you get him around the ankle, stiff arm, hops out of that tackle, and then what happens again? He dives in from the five-yard line because he's an athletic freak, and this is what David Njoku does. You know, so it eventually the running game did get settled enough where in that fourth quarter we kind of leaned on him a little bit on that last – next to last drive that we had because we had the one drive where we kneeled it. Um, but, you know, we got – a little bit going. There were a couple holding calls that did uh, set us back a little bit in the run game. But, you know, it, when we finally went to the stop route option and the bubble screen option saying, if you're going to give us a couple yards, we're going to take a couple yards because our offensive players are going to take a short gain and put it in the end zone. And if you look at it, you know, okay, Malcolm Lewis, his touchdown was inside the 10, but that was an RPO where he faked like he was going to block and then all of a sudden he's in the back of the end zone. Um, you had that route combination with the site adjustment like we're talking about with Barrios up the seam. But Amon Richards, it looked like they were playing tag at recess because there were three or four guys who reached out and they're like, okay, well, you know, we, we got you on the shoulder, we got you on the leg. No, I mean, seven on seven, he's down. But in a game with pads, he's still running. You know, David Njoku, you know, one-on-one -on -one with the defender. There's few defenders in college, let alone the NFL, one-on-one -on, -one on the outside who are going to be it, successful to the point where they're going to stop him dead at first contact. And David Njoku's run through those tackles and made those plays in the touchdowns all year. That was his, what, eighth or ninth touchdown of the season. I mean, he just does that. You know, so uh, the offense eventually did get rolling. I don't have the stats in front of me. Maybe Mark does. But, you know, once after those first 20 minutes of the game, it really just picked up. And it was – I mean, yeah, there, there were adjustments to the scheme, but it just ended up being we had better guys and just get our guys the ball and let them work and, you know, bring up the points. So, yeah, five three and outs to start the ball game, and you still finish with 363 yards of total offense, which in this day and age doesn't sound like a lot, but when you go five three and outs, that's mostly coming in the second half. So uh, the offense got cranked up, and uh, – Kaya spread it out, uh, six different receivers with at least three catches. Uh, much of the nation was introduced to Amon Richards and his ability. He had a huge freshman season, and obviously his future is bright. Yeah, no, Amon Richards, uh, he's great. Freshman All-American. Um, you know, I, I did some research at the behest of a couple guys, uh, friends of mine on Twitter, but Rivals.com, one of the recruiting sites, had 12 or 13 receivers in the state of Florida last cycle who they ranked as better than Amon Richards. Actually, I'm going to click over so I can give you this exact statistic. One second. But that group of gentlemen, of course, right now when I need it, maybe it's on my computer. I'm going to find it. But he ended this season with nearly a thousand yards. Um, came up just short in the bowl game. But all the guys in front of him on the rivals rankings last year, they totaled – oh, there it is. Ha! So all 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 
14 guys that were ranked as better than Amon Richards. They combined in the regular season for 77 catches for 958 yards and eight touchdowns. While Amon Richards, after the bowl game, has – I'm going to click over here and do receiving. After the bowl game, he has 49 catches for 934 and three touchdowns. So, you know, a collective group of 14 guys has more touchdowns than Richards. But nobody in that group has more than 19 catches. Nobody in that other group has more than 238 yards. Nobody else even matches Amon Richards with three touchdowns. The highest is two. Uh, out of every all of those other guys that rivals had ranked over him, so you know there, people, I, some people just didn't see it from the beginning. But I was not one of those. Um, I, I I saw it from his junior year of high school when I first got introduced to him on the recruiting scene. Um, and he played really well, uh, and he should be a household name. I hope that he stays for four years. But I, if he performs to the level of his talent, he should be three years in the first or second round draft pick. Honestly, so. You know, uh, it, it was great to see him do well. Um, you know, and just all those guys actually, you know, step up their games. Uh, you know, and with Brad throwing for 282 and four touchdowns, obviously it's not one guy doing everything by himself. But, you know, there were a lot of guys who really stepped up in that game, and we do have talent on offense, and it, it showed through. So it's an impressive cap to the season. Uh, the Canes finish at 9-4 and four after defeating what at least was on paper as a top 15 team in the country. <clears throat> Uh, 31 to 14, and it wasn't that close. 